Good afternoon. And thank you, Secretary Azar, for joining us today at CDC headquarters. It's a privilege to have you with us, and we appreciate your leadership throughout this unprecedented response. COVID-19 is the most significant public health challenge our country's faced in more than a century. And the pandemic is not over. Earlier this week, COVID virus cases reached over 40 million globally. Here in the United States, we're approaching a critical phase. In a few moments, Dr. Jay Butler, CDC's Deputy Director for Infectious Disease and the former incident manager of the CDC's COVID-19 response will provide you a brief update on our current domestic situation. I know it's been a difficult year for Americans, but we are gonna come through this on the other side. I'm also optimistic that we'll have a limited supply of one or more COVID vaccines available for distribution before the end of this year, but we're not quite there yet. That is why it's so important that all of us remain uh, diligent in our efforts to defeat this virus and to protect ourselves, our families, and our communities. At CDC, science, data, and service have driven our unprecedented response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And our mission is to protect the health of every American and save lives. Personally, I'm incredibly proud of the men and women at CDC, and it's truly been an honor for me to lead them during these extraordinary times and to lead these extraordinary people. I would like now to introduce Dr. Jay Butler, who will make remarks and then followed by Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, and then we'll be happy to take your questions. Jay? Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. It's fabulous to be able to speak to you today. And thank you for that introduction, Dr. Redfield. We're here to give you the latest on what's going on with the COVID-19 pandemic. Unfortunately, we're seeing a distressing trend here in the United States with COVID-19 cases increasing in nearly 75% of the country. To date, we've confirmed over 8.1 million cases and sadly, over 220,000 deaths since January. I know these are numbers, but these are also people, and we mourn these losses. The past week, we've seen nearly 60,000 cases a day on average, as well as 700 deaths. Here in Georgia, we've also seen an increase in the number of cases, despite the decline that we had experienced beginning in August. And we're also seeing cases increase in really all parts of the country, uh, in the Midwest particularly, likely in part because people are moving indoors with the arrival of cooler temperatures. Another factor is that smaller, more intimate gatherings of family, friends, and neighbors may be driving infection as well, especially as these gatherings move indoors and adherence to face coverings and social distancing may not be optimal. I recognize that we are all getting tired of the impact that COVID-19 has had on our lives. We get tired of wearing masks, but it continues to be as important as it's ever been. And I would say it's more important than ever as we move into the fall season. It's incredibly important to continue these steps also as we look towards the upcoming holidays. We know that every activity that involves interacting with others has some degree of risk right now. There are four general rules of thumb for assessing risk and deciding how to best protect yourself and those you love. First, the more closely you interact with others. Second, the longer the interaction asks. Third, if the interaction is indoors rather than outdoors. And fourth, interactions with the greatest number of people translate into the higher risks of COVID-19 spread. Understanding these risks and how to adapt different prevention measures can help you protect yourselves and your families and your communities. 
We all want to live as safely as we can and minimize the risk of COVID-19 while it is circulating. Secretary Azar will highlight what people can do to protect themselves, but I want to spend a few minutes talking about an additional tool we'll likely have very soon, the COVID-19 vaccine. As Dr. Redfield mentioned, we're cautiously optimistic that vaccine will be available, although likely in limited quantities, before the end of 2020. Preparing for implementing a successful COVID-19 vaccine program is a crucial next step as part of our overall effort to protect Americans, reduce the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, and continue to restore more normalcy to our lives and our country. CDC is a proud part of Operation Warp Speed, the partnership between parts of HHS and the Department of Defense to develop, make, and distribute millions of COVID-19 vaccine doses as quickly as possible while ensuring that they are safe and effective. In other words, we want to make sure they work. I'm pleased to announce that all jurisdictions, including Georgia, have submitted their initial vaccine program plans. These plans are an important milestone in our efforts to ensure successful delivery and administration of safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines to the ultimate goal that everyone who wants to be immunized can be. Over the past month, CDC has provided technical assistance to each jurisdiction, including nearly daily check-ins with jurisdictional staff, weekly conference calls with immunization and preparedness managers, and in some cases, on-site assistance. My colleagues are currently conducting a thorough review of the draft plans and will be providing feedback to the jurisdiction during the next two weeks. It's important to recognize that these plans are flexible because things may change as we learn more about which vaccines become available in what amounts and when. Additionally, each plan will include an executive summary that we plan to post online later this month, allowing for maximal transparency and a general understanding of each jurisdiction's approach. I want to highlight also the pharmacy partnership we announced last week with CVS and Walgreens. Again, we anticipate that initially the vaccine will be available in a limited supply. And when the limited, uh, when the supply of vaccine is limited, our efforts to vaccinate may need to focus on those who are at highest risk of severe disease, as well as those critical to the response, including those who provide care to people in the healthcare system. People at risk include those in long-term care facilities, like nursing homes and assisting living facilities, as well as independent living facilities. The Pharmacy Partnership for Long-Term Care Program provides end-to-end -end management of the COVID-19 vaccination process, including getting vaccines to facilities. It provides for on-site vaccinations and fulfillment of all reporting requirements. Long-term care facilities will have the option of partnering with CVS and Walgreens, whose combined national footprint will allow most facilities nationwide to opt into this program. Before I close, I want to remind you that tomorrow the Vaccine and, Re and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee is meeting to discuss the latest, latest COVID-19 vaccine development. And next week, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices will be meeting. Both of these meetings and independent committees will be broadcast live for the public to see the data that is being discussed, as well as the process that's being used to ensure that Americans have a safe and effective variety of COVID-19 vaccines. We know that stopping this pandemic is going to take all of our tools, hand washing, masks, social distancing, and hopefully quite soon vaccines. Taken together, these tools are our best chance of getting our communities, schools, and health systems back into normal operations. I'd like to turn the podium over at this point to Alex Azar, Secretary Azar. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Butler and Dr. Redfield, and thanks to everybody at CDC for hosting us here today. It's an honor to be here to express my gratitude to the incredibly hardworking team here at CDC for their efforts throughout this pandemic. 
While in Atlanta, I've also had the chance to learn about the heroic efforts of the health care providers, the janitorial staff, everybody at Grady Memorial Hospital, as well as Emory University's hospital's work on clinical trials for Regeneron's antibody cocktail and Moderna's candidate vaccine. Thanks to how we designed Operation Warp Speed, if and when the FDA gives the go-ahead for these therapeutic and vaccine products, we will have supplies already manufactured and ready for distribution. In conjunction with Operation Warp Speed, the CDC, as Dr. Butler mentioned, is leading the effort to coordinate vaccine distribution and administration, working with the 64 public health jurisdictions they partner with on vaccines each year. I want to offer a special thank you to every American who has volunteered for COVID-19 clinical trials or helped raise awareness, especially among diverse communities where we need representation in our clinical trials. Anyone interested in signing up for a vaccine trial can visit coronavirus.gov and for therapeutic trials, go to riseabovecovid.org. While we make this exciting progress on vaccines and therapeutics, we see concerning trends in many parts of the country, as Dr. Butler explained. I'm briefed with the latest data from across the country by CDC's career experts each and every morning. There is hope on the way in the form of safe and effective vaccines in a matter of weeks or months. But in the meantime, to bridge to that next phase, we have to take steps that can keep ourselves, our families, and our communities safe. Those are the three W's. Wash your hands. Watch your distance. Wear your face covering when you can't watch your distance. And avoid settings where you can't do those things. Thank you all for joining us here today. Thank you to the American people for the incredible sacrifices that you have made throughout this pandemic. And thank you to, again, to the dedicated team here at CDC for their incredibly hard work. We're now happy to take some questions. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Last week, Emory University's Dean of Public Health called your agency's undermining of the CDC under President Trump unforgivable uh, and called the president's leadership anti-science. Uh, Dr. Butler, I believe, was quoted in ProPublica as saying he was deeply concerned that actions the agency was forced to take would cost lives. Have you discussed any of that uh, in your conversations today since all this happened last week? And do you have any concerns about the allegations? Well, I'm not going to talk about my discussions internal here within CDC. What did I come down here to do? I came down here to thank the incredible people of the CDC for their work. We talked about uh, the most recent data around the efficacy and importance of wearing face coverings. We talked about the vaccine planning work around distribution of vaccines. And I got an update about the incredible progress CDC is making on increasing the data submissions from nursing homes into the National Health Safety Network. In terms of the question that you asked, let me be really clear. The CDC is the premier epidemiological organization on the face of the planet. When we go to other countries, as I often did before the COVID pandemic, they literally are named the blank Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, named after this very institution. So this is a crown jewel of American and global public health. We revere it. But CDC plays a role in what is a very unique, unprecedented pandemic. It has been 100 years, as Dr. Redfield noted, since we have had a public health crisis of this type. This is bigger than H1N1. This is not SARS. This is not MERS. This is something that impacts the entire government and the entire economy. CDC plays a very important role in that. But it plays a role of public health epi and epidemiology. There are other key players, even within my department, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Agency with important equities around mental health, opioid abuse during the pandemic, NIH and FDA around research and countermeasures, the Veterans Department around care for our veterans, the Defense Department around force protection, transportation, DHS around transportation issues, international commerce, the State Department, international relations, spread of disease globally. So the CDC plays a very important and vital role but in a pandemic of this scope, size, and magnitude, it plays a role, not just the role. And I think some of the people who comment are 
not having actually lived in or led in this organization during this type of a crisis, failing to appreciate that. But make no mistake, the CDC is a science and evidence-led organization. We respect CDC's science and evidence conclusions. What comes out of CDC at the end of the day is Dr. Redfield's conclusions around science and evidence with the support of his team. And that's how we operate, and that's how we're going to keep operating. Yes? Thank you very much for the question. I think just to take the big picture, as we said before, C CDC is science-based and data-driven. And as a consequence, as we get more data and understand the science of COVID, uh, we're going to continue to incorporate that in our recommendations. Um, originally, uh, contact, as you know, that was considered to be high risk for potential exposure to COVID was someone within six feet that was for more than 15 minutes. Uh, there is some recent data uh, that has uh, been determined, an individual who had a series of shorter contacts, but over time added up to more than 15 minutes, became infected. And clarifying that new science that new data into uh, our contact recommendation is what you're alluding to. And again, it's based on data that one didn't have four months ago, but it is data now that we have based on uh, situations that recorded. Uh, the second part of your question, um, could you say it again for a second? I think for the, for the effort in, in quarantine. So again, as you know, the data that we have right now uh, that's in play is that individuals who have had a high risk exposure um, have a period of time after that when they actually become detectable for virus. Originally, the average was a little more than five days and then, then new data showed it was a little more than seven days. When you looked at the data collectively, if you did the cutoff at 14 days, you actually identified almost everyone that was positive. If you tried to shorten it to 10 days, we found that we missed around maybe 12% of people. And so therefore, we stayed at the 14 days. Now, all of those decisions were made without testing. So now there's a series of studies gathering data that are trying to determine, can you use testing during the quarantine to determine if you could shorten the quarantine from 14 days to 10 days or seven days. So again, it's data driven, it's under evaluation. Obviously we don't want to have people be quarantined for you know, 14 days unnecessarily. So we are working hard to see if there's data now that we have testing that may allow us to be more confident that if we do testing at day five or day seven, that we can use that information to more effectively understand that we could shorten the quarantine period. So it's not a policy, it's basically a ma it's an area of, of, of research where we're gathering that data now. Yeah, if, if again, I, I try to say this uh, uh, many times, I get the opportunity Science is a science-based data-driven service organization, CDC is. We're not an opinion organization. So if we get data that supports the change in our recommendations, then those recommendations will be changed. Yes, in the middle. In previous years, 
Uh, I think we're up nearly 300,000 deaths, and I believe CDC said two out of every three deaths is COVID-related. Could you just talk about that? Sure. So the concept of excess deaths is one that may sound a little cold, but basically life is a sexually transmitted condition, which is 100% fatal. So we know that all of us are going to die eventually. There is a expected periodicity to that. There uh, is the, the average life expectancy. We know that uh, at any time there's a certain amount of seasonal variation also. And this is uh, something that we've looked at for years in terms of the number of excess deaths that are caused during an influenza season. Using that same type of methodology to look at what's happened during the time of the COVID pandemic is how we're able to come up with the, the fact that we know more people have died this year. We know that some people are going to die uh, no matter what. But comparing the total number to that expected number leads to a difference that ultimately leads to the 300,000 excess deaths that you uh, just, just mentioned. About two thirds of those we can link directly to COVID-19. Um, what about the other third? That's a, you know, an important question to address as well. Some of those may be uh, unrelated, uh, perhaps because of uh, limitations on access to medical care, some of them also may be unrecognized impacts of COVID-19. So when we look at factors like cardiovascular death that aren't directly linked to COVID-19, there's not a really great explanation uh, for why we would see that increase in cardiovascular death. And we know that it's possible that COVID-19 could be playing a role in those deaths as well. And overall, I think it, it emphasizes the importance of the prevention measures that we've been talking about. Dr. Butler, you said that um, the, a vaccine uh, that could be available for distribution towards the end of the year. And I'm sorry, um, does that mean how widely and um, how long do you think it could be before a vaccine is available for widespread distribution to anyone who needs it? Would that be March, summer of 2021? Sure. Um, I mean, these are these are the questions that we are asking every day as we move forward with vaccine planning, because as you're aware, there's a number of different products that are currently in clinical trial. Uh, there's a process to make sure that those vaccines are safe and effective that we have to go through as well. And a number of the clinical trials are ongoing and still in a fairly early phase. So. Uh, I wish we had a crystal ball so that we could look at it. I wish I could say everything is going to go 100% uh, uh, according to plan. But we also know that we have to be ready uh, for if it doesn't. I think looking at the current trends in the uh, studies and the production of vaccines, it's reasonable to expect that we will have at least one, possibly two products available before the end of the calendar year. The next question is, OK, that's when, and again, no guarantees, how much. And that's, that's also part of the iterative process as we uh, continue to learn what the production capacity will be going forward. One of the uh, beauties of Operation Warp Speed is we're not waiting until we have all of the, uh, the studies completed and the reviews done before we start the production process. It may be that we find, for instance, that a, a vaccine is not effective and that's a vaccine that ultimately is not going to be administered to Americans. And, and, uh, and if I could just, in terms of your question around the timelines on, on quantities, so as Dr. Butler mentioned, we've got the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, which are uh, very close to, if not fully enrolled in their clinical trials. When we get data out of those, we'll really be dependent on events in the trial that's outside of anyone's control. Um, we are, as Dr. Butler mentioned, concurrently manufacturing commercial scale production of all six of the vaccines that we have investments or contracts with, including, of course, Pfizer and Moderna. And we expect that we would have, by the end of this year, uh, enough vaccine to be, that is FDA authorized, to be able to vaccinate all of our vulnerable, the most vulnerable individuals. Then by the end of January, we expect we'd have enough to vaccinate all seniors as well as our healthcare workers and first responders. And by the end of March to early April, enough vaccine for all Americans who would want to take a vaccine. Let me, we've got, we have an overflow room because of uh, abiding by CDC's restrictions on number of people in the room. 
Could I ask you, do we have anyone on the phone, a question from the phone that has been asked? We'll turn over to the phone now if somebody has a question. Do we have Bloomberg on the phone? Please go ahead. Um, hi, uh, this is Emma Port with Bloomberg. Um, we were told by uh, uh, the leader of Operation Warp Speed today that AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson trials are going to resume this week. Can you share any more about this as well as the nature of, of these safety concerns? Uh, you broke up a great deal there. I'll try to, I, I believe your question was regarding the status of the AstraZeneca vaccine clinical trials. So. Um, uh, as of now, within the United States, uh, unless something has changed in the time since I've been standing here, the, uh, the AstraZeneca trial remains on clinical trial hold here in the United States because of uh, the review by the FDA and the company uh, as to a possible serious adverse event. And what we do is the company, as well as the FDA, examine the data to determine when there's a serious event, is there a connection to the vaccine? Do we believe that's a valid connection, a causative connection? Um, and if so, uh, should the trial be restarted and continued, or are there uh, other precautions that one should take, for instance, modifying the informed consent forms, uh, anything about the protocol? That's part of that. Uh, so the FDA has been working to gather uh, data and information from uh, AstraZeneca uh, to make to assist it in that evaluation. Uh, and as far as I know, that process is continuing as we speak. That'll be a determination made by made by the FDA. One more. Okay. Yep. Can we see if the, on the phone? Who do we have on the phone? Do we have Fox on the phone? Secretary Azar, thank you for taking our questions today. Uh, the President of the United States has held numerous rallies around the country, many in the hottest of hot spots, and most with no social distancing and little mask wearing. The president also says we are rounding the corner. In simple English, sir, are we rounding the corner? And are these rallies a good idea? And the second part of my question, sir, is the president has also been critical of Dr. Fauci lately. What impact do you believe this will have as your department tries to distribute and convince Americans to take a vaccine that many surveys are now showing some Americans are skeptical about or concerned about taking? So in terms, of, in terms of your first question, uh, listen, our guidance is the same regardless of setting. Wash your hands, watch your distance, wear your face covering when you can't watch your distance and avoid settings where you can't do those things. For anybody reconnected to school, reconnected to work, going back to worship, or reconnecting to healthcare, or engaging in the political and civic life of our country, our advice remains the same, which is, Wash your hands, watch your distance, wear face coverings when you can't watch your distance and avoid settings where you don't where you aren't going to be able to do do those things. That that advice is the same regardless of any type of gathering. Uh, with regard to your second question, the uh, uh, the president has assembled and has direct access to many different advisors, including the, the people on this stage as well as others. I try to make sure from the beginning of this of this outbreak that the president is getting the best medical scientific advice from a diverse range of the top doctors uh, within this department. Uh, and the president hears divergent viewpoints. The president's made clear that he has great respect for Dr. Fauci and has a close relationship with Dr. Fauci. He said that in follow-up from those other comments. Uh, that should have no impact on, on the vaccine work that we do. The vaccine work that we're doing the American people should feel very reassured by the process that is established here. There are five independent checks around vaccine regulation. First, a vaccine clinical trial has pre-specified endpoints. They're statistical, and actually these drug companies have been transparent for the first time in history, laying out exactly what those statistical endpoints are. There is a totally independent data and safety monitoring board that will look at the data as it comes in determine if those endpoints have been met. If and only if those endpoints are met, that data gets revealed to the company and the FDA. Then the company will have its own second independent process. It will have to meet their ethical standards for submission of an application for either an emergency use authorization or a biologic license. 
3rd, it'll come to the FDA where the FDA will evaluate that vaccine according to two sets of guidance that it put out. It's general vaccine guidance for COVID and it's second EUA guidance for what it would require and expect in terms of approval. Then you've got the fourth check, which is, as Dr. Butler mentioned, the advisory committee at the FDA, an external advisory committee that will be webcast. Um, a public external advisory process will advise the FDA. And then fifth, the decision about whether to approve or authorize a vaccine at FDA will be made by FDA's career scientists. So that's five independent checks. That combined with how this is working so far. Look at, look at the fact that we have three clinical trials that have been put on hold because of any type of safety concern. The system's working. This is being played by the book. So one antibody trial has been put on hold, two vaccine trials put on hold to ensure that FDA and we are putting patient safety at the center, following all regulatory ethical standards for development of both therapeutics and vaccines. All of those elements of process should reassure the American people that when a vaccine or therapeutic comes out with the authorization or approval of FDA, it represents FDA's career scientists best judgment that it meets their scientific evidence, legal and regulatory standards. So thank you all very much for coming today. We, Dr. Redfield and I've got to get to the airport, but we really appreciate your being here today. And Dr. Butler, very much appreciate that. As, as I said, Dr. Butler is the senior career official at CDC leading the coronavirus effort. And we're very grateful to him for his leadership. Uh, and I'd like to uh, as we move into the future, I want to make sure, as you have had access, we're going to make sure that there are continued interactions and opportunities uh, for, for you all to be continuing to engage with CDC as well as our career leaders here. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.